All right. Good morning, Washington Church. Let's stand and join together in the call to worship. How great is our God. How awesome are your deeds. Lord, you are gracious and compassionate. You are my rock, my shield, and my fortress. Therefore, we will sing your praises and speak of your goodness. Jesus, we're worthy of all worship and praise. Reveal yourself to us. You guys did it. 
the matching thing. Come on now. Good morning. Good morning, Washington Church. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're so glad you guys are here this morning. Whether you're with us here or online, we're so glad we're together this morning to worship in the house of the Lord. It's, a, it's an amazing privilege. So we're so, so glad to be here together. Um, I want to just have a few announcements. Make sure you guys know what's happening this morning. Um, on your way in, you should have gotten a bulletin and uh, a connection card. So this tells you a little bit about what's happening at Washington. The card, if you want to fill it out, if you're new especially, please fill us out and let us know about yourself. But if you have any praises or God stories or way the Holy Spirit's moving or a request for us to come in prayer with you, whatever it is, use this card. You can drop them off um, with an usher or in the black boxes that are on either side of the sanctuary. Um, you can also drop any giving off on, in those black boxes. You can also give online at washingtonchurch.org or use this fancy QR code that's on the back of here too. Um, we so appreciate your generosity. Uh, it allows God to do some amazing things, um, which is pretty cool to see and be a part of. So, um, so please... Uh, Feel free to do that. Um, I want to now invite Lindsay Miller up. She's going to give a quick announcement on um, the Afghan resettlement program that we had started a while ago. There's been some changes and, and now some new information. So Lindsay's going to come up and share what's happening with that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay Miller, and I've been serving on the Afghan core team and had three updates for you all on where we're at with things right now. So as most of you know, um, in the past couple months, our team learned that the Afghan Sponsor Circle program that we applied to through Samaritan's Purse to resettle an Afghan family in our community, that program ended and we found out that we would not be receiving a family that we were hoping and planning to receive. Um, around that time, uh, Mitch Macker and our contact at Water for Ishmael uh, brought forward to our team the possibility of partnering with an Afghan family that's already here in our community, um, specifically a family that uh, lives a couple streets over from our church where several fam uh, family members um, are new to the United States from Afghanistan. Um, so our team prayed about that. We updated the elders and understanding that it was going to be a very different approach than what we were initially planning to do through the sponsorship circle program. So after praying, our team decided that we would like to move forward in building a relationship with this family, um, but understanding that it's going to be a much more informal and kind of fluid process moving forward and just focused on building a relationship with them. So Jacintha and Dylan Murphy met with this family for the first time yesterday. Um, Water for Ishmael uh, coordin coordinated that meeting, and it went really, really well. And the family's looking forward to connecting with people on our team moving forward. So if that is something that you're interested in getting involved with, um, we would be happy to connect with you and give you more information around that. But we're excited to see how God's going to move in this new direction. Uh, so that brings me to my second update. Um, we collected monetary donations and gift cards in preparation for the Sponsorship Circle family. We are not going to be having a financial relationship with the family that we're going to be meeting. Um, so in the next week, we're going to be reaching out to those individuals that gave in that way. And if you would like to redirect redirect your donation to another fund at the church, we can do that. Or if you would like your donation returned to you, we'll, we'll facilitate that as well. So look forward to that communication in the next week. 
And then the third update is that all the household items that we collected back in March through the household drive, uh, we worked with Water for Ishmael in identifying a family from Jordan who recently arrived um, to the U.S. and they were essentially in need of everything we collected. So we were able to move those items from the church basement over to that family in the past week or so, and they were very, very grateful for that. So that's that's been taken care of. So I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of our team so much for all of your generosity uh, this year and just your prayers and so many of your willingness to uh, get involved and volunteer. Um, I know that it looks a lot different than like what we were envisioning, but I think God's going to continue to work and move. And I just wanted to say thank you. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, reach out to myself, Lindsay Miller, or Jacintha Murphy, and we would love to connect with you. Thanks, Lindsay. God's good. Yeah. God moves even if circumstances change, right? So we know that, and we can have hope in that. Um, a couple more things kid-wise. You'll see some of these green bags um, hanging up over here and there. I think there's some out in the hallway out there. There are new wiggle bags. I like the name wiggle bags. Uh, if you've got young kids that are in this space with you and they're wigglers uh, and they need some, something to occupy their time, those bags are now available. Um, if you're an adult and need something to occupy your time, I suppose, but, but they're really intended for our kids. Uh, but that's what those green bags are. So feel free to use those or tell your friends or if you see someone that might be in need of it, feel free to let them know that's what those are. Um, there. So now I actually want to invite um, all the kids that are here in the, um, in the sanctuary, come on up here and, and sit up here with me. Come sit up on the stage. I'm going to come down this way. All right, come on up. If, you, if you're a kid, come on up here. All right. Oh, I love it. Okay, so of the kids that are up here, raise your hand if you went to Vacation Bible School this past week. That, that counts. All right. So do you see this, guys? All, look at all these kids we have here. Most of them came to Vacation Bible. It's awesome. If you weren't there, so you can put your hand down. If you weren't there, if you're a kid and you weren't there, and if you're an adult, actually, can I have all the adults that help with VBS raise their hand? I just want to say a thank you. If you're in here and you helped with VBS, awesome. Thank you, thank you. We could not have done VBS without awesome music and games and shepherds. And it's, it's an amazing partnership that we have with Hope Lutheran. It's really cool. We had 110-ish kids at Vacation Bible School. Um, I'm going to show a video first about some of the things that we got to do at VBS, and then we're going to share a little bit about what we see. So you guys can turn around, kiddos, if you want to see this.
on, didn't you wish you were at Vacation Bible School? That is so fun. I have lots of things that I love at Vacation Bible School, and seeing Miss Bridget up front, like, doing some moves with worship was one of my favorites. So ask her some of the dance moves when we get down. Okay, you guys, so let's, let's recap really quick. I want your eyes up here. Attention up here, guys. Because we saw the video, you guys got to see it, but they might not know all the things we got to learn. So I want to talk real quick about each day what we learned. Because we learned not just about a food truck party, which was the theme, but we more importantly learned about how God provides and how he loves us and how we can trust him and obey, right? So on day one, who can tell me what day one was? Stand up and do the motion. Sam, stand up. Can you stand up and do it? It was what? God? God is great. How did the motions go? If you remember, God is great, right? God was great, yeah. And we learned about, what story did we learn about? How is God great? He provided what for his people, Grace? The quail and the manna. Right, quail in the morning, and, or manna in the morning and quail at night, right? We got some motions for that too. Um, God provided for his family. It was so amazing what he did and how he gave to his people. Uh, then the second day, Elijah, what we learned on the second day, God is what? God is good. Who remembers the motions for that one? Gina. Good, right. God is good. And what was the story about God is good? Well, so Asher, what did we learn about that? I think it was David and the widow. Not yet. It was not David and the widow. Who? Elijah. Elijah and the widow. Yeah. It was about Elijah and how, um, and how God told the widow that Elijah would come. And, and then she had faith in God, but then she didn't have enough um, flour and oil. She could only make one loaf of bread. And then um, Elijah um, requested that she could cut, up, cut it up in pieces so that they could all have one. But then, but then God gave her eternal flour and oil so that she could have um, bread for all of December. I don't know if it was December, but it was until the rain came, right? Yeah, that's right. So if you want to know about any Bible story, Asher's, Asher's your guy. He knows, he knows all the things. But she trusted God, right, Asher? She trusted God and God provided, right? She had faith, exactly. So day three was, we did God is great, God is good. Day three was, let us thank God for our food. Who can remember those motions? So let us thank God. God for our food. Right. Okay. What about that story? Who was that? It was someone and his friends. Who can tell me? Daniel and his friends. What did they have to do? They had to trust God that he would provide um, veggies and water for him because so, he told them not to eat the king's food. And did they do it? Yes. So what did they do? They, well, they obeyed. obeyed. And what happened to them? They were stronger than the kid, king's men. Right. They obeyed God and he made them strong. Right. They obeyed God, and he made them strong. Uh, day four, so God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for his, our food. By his hands, we all are fed. Who remembers that one? By his hands, we all are fed. All right, what was that story? This one was about Jesus. Gina, do you remember? Um, it was, what? oh, um, Jesus was with his disciples, and there was, like, a crowd of, like, 5,000 people that were hungry, yeah. and this one boy had five loaves of bread and two fish, yeah. and with one pair, Jesus fed the 5,000 people. Right, yeah. He performed a miracle. There's a really good song to that one, too. Five, right, five loaves of bread, two fish, and Jesus performed an amazing miracle and provided for people, provided what they needed with even leftovers. And you guys, remember what I was telling you at craft time if you were there, that the power that Jesus had within him to do that lives within us. The Holy Spirit gives us that, that power as well, even today. And he wants us to do the same thing, perform miracles today. Last day, God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. That one was give us, Lord, our daily bread. Bread, right. Okay, last story. Who can tell me? Joshua, can you tell me what it was? Oh. Jesus and, were you there on the last day, right? Jesus and Peter. Oh, um, Jesus, P 
Peter and his buddies were fishing all night and they hadn't caught anything and Jesus was on the land and he said, um, have you caught anything yet? And they're like, no, well then throw your nets in again and you'll catch a lot of fish. And they caught, to be exact, 153 fish <coughs> and Jesus cooked some of them for breakfast and asked Peter three times if Peter loved him and those three times Peter replied, you know I do. And the three times Jesus replied, then feed my sheep. What did he mean by feed my sheep? Um, tell the world about me. Yes, right? That's our job. Does God still want us to do that? Does Jesus still want us to feed a sheep? Landon, do you think Jesus says to you, feed my sheep? What does he want you to do? Tell people about him, right? So that's our job. One of our many amazing jobs we get to do for God and work with him is tell other people how much he loves them, right? So you guys, we had an awesome time at VBS. Thanks for all your support. These kids learned a ton. They had a great time. Um, let's pray, and then I'll dismiss you guys. Lord God, we are so grateful for fun weeks like Vacation Bible School. Um, we're, we are, we're grateful for the space that we have and the people that serve um, and the fun activities that we have, God, but it's more important than that. It's fun and it's good, but oh man, God, we get to learn about you and how much you love us. We get to understand more about our purpose um, and how we can love others and how we can bring the kingdom of God to those around us. So I pray that these kids take that. I pray that they remember, whether they were at Vacation Bible School or not, that they know that one, they're loved by you so deeply, you were, that they were made on purpose and for a great purpose, and that they would be bold and share their faith and their love of God with others, and so that others may be brought into the family along with us. So I pray that, Lord Jesus, in your heavenly name, we love you so much, God. Amen. All right, kids, you are dismissed. All right, will you guys stand and continue to worship with us? And just a reminder, um, as we sing, there will be people available to pray with you, uh, to rejoice with you, whatever you need people to come to the feet of Jesus for. Um, they're here. They'll be wearing yellow lanyards. They, I don't see anyone right now, but <laughs> uh, they'll be around the walls of the sanctuary. So if you need something, don't hesitate. Um, they're there, they're available, they're excited uh, to pray with you. So that's always available for you this morning.
chasing the things of this world more than him, for thinking that the things of this world could ever satisfy us more than he can. So we're just going to take a minute um, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the places in our lives that we are satisfied with the things of this world, the places in our lives that we are seeking this world more than we're seeking him. The places in our lives where we think, if I could just have this thing, or if this thing would just get fixed, that everything would be fine, and the Lord's saying, no, I'm all you need. I'm all you need. So we're going to take a minute and uh, just allow the Holy Spirit to reveal those things in your life, and repent for those so you can seek Him and seek Him.
the name above every other name. 
Jesus, we thank you that you are never moved. That the earth may pass away, but Jesus, you never change. We thank you that you see all, that you know all, and that you are a firm foundation, a solid place to build our trust. Jesus, forgive us for the times that we thought that we didn't need you, for the times that we thought we knew better than you. Forgive us for the times that we sought comfort outside of you before you. Jesus, we thank you for being steadfast through every storm of life. We thank you for your faithfulness, Jesus. We ask today that our hearts and our ears would be open to what you have for us, that our spirits would be ready to receive, that we would be ready to receive your word, hear it new and fresh this morning, Jesus. We thank you for meeting with us in this place. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning everyone. It's good to, uh, to be here with you. Um, as we continue our series uh, talking about the kingdom of God, I can share with you that there are times uh, in the life of somebody who studies the scriptures, um, pastors, scholars, everyday human beings, we're all called to do that, um, where you come, ac- you come across a text that just kind of floors you, and you don't really know what to do with it. Um, and you don't really know exactly what it says, because there's so many layers and so much depth to it, and you could go a hundred different ways with it. This, this morning, we're going to look at one of those scripture passages. Uh, maybe you've got it figured out, but I'm still in, in process. But it's a reminder to me of the never-ending depth of God's written word to us. There, there is no end. Um, You can go over a scripture passage a hundred times or a thousand times, and there's still more there for us to get and to glean and to learn from. And so that's why we're going to continually keep ourselves in the scriptures, in the Word of God, um, steeped in that, so that we can recognize the Lord's voice when He speaks to us, but understand what He has to say to us. So this morning we're going to be in in John chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, um, open to John chapter 3. If you're somebody who takes notes... Today is your your day. I'll just put it that way. Uh, This might be one of those messages you need to listen to more than once. Um, I reached out to several people actually to to ask for their help with this passage, just to give insight, and and I got some great feedback back, and it was really helpful, really encouraging. Um, But again, this is one of those, those messages where I left... I mean, I was here till 10 something last night and felt like I could have kept going, but at some point you got to stop, you know, you got to, you got to preach on Sunday morning with what the Lord gives you. And so I'm going to do the best that I can to share with you what I have, but to no extent is this exhaustive in any way. Um, And so I would encourage you to keep going on your own study of of John, but what I want to do is in this kingdom of God conversation this morning is I want to answer the question or ask the question and, and begin to wrestle with the answer to the question with which is, who gets into the kingdom of God? Which is the conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus. Okay? John uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, 
who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So let me set the scene for you here in John chapter 3. Jesus is sitting before Nicodemus. Well, who's Nicodemus? Nicodemus is one of the highest ruling elites in Israel. Um, Israel, the Jewish people had a system of ruling, um, of overarching men who oversaw the religious system and had all the right answers. And they were called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was, was composed of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and it made up 70 men, which goes back to uh, the Deuteronomy story where God told Moses to select men, and he selects 70 men to help him oversee or rule over Israel. They kept and they held on to that, and actually they, they doubled down with that after they came back from Babylon, the Babylonian exile. And so he's part of that group. And within that group, like any other group, there's a hierarchy. We don't know exactly where Nicodemus is, but we think he's pretty high up. And the only thing higher would be the high priest himself, which is the ultimate position in that time period. He was in charge of the temple system and the worship in Israel. The other thing it's important to know is, is John, the Gospel of John, is an entirely different animal than the rest of the Gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptics because because about 80 to 85% of their content is similar. That doesn't mean they're the same. It just means a lot of what they talk about overlaps. But each of the Gospels comes with a different bent and a different priority that they're, it's trying to communicate. So it's important to keep that in mind. That's why we have three different accounts. It's not redundancy. It's necessary. John was written 30, 40 plus years after the rest of the Gospels had been written. So John's coming at it from a very different perspective, okay? He's the only one still around, the only one still alive. The Lord kept him alive for a reason and set him apart, and he's writing in exile. He's writing the gospel, and he's writing First and Second and Third John. All that is written by the same person. And when John writes, there are stories in John like this one that aren't found anywhere else. And the other thing that's important to know about John is when he uses words, oftentimes these words have layered meanings to them. And we're going to look at some of those. And so it's not as simple as that red means red for John. Okay? And I'll give you some examples of those. But it's important for us to have that context. And John writes with an, an understanding of what's going on, but that understanding also comes with a, a metaphoric layer, layer of truth to it as well. So we have the story, and then we have what's below the story that John's trying to communicate on a larger whole. So I'll give you an example of that. When, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he comes at night. For John, the nighttime has depth and meaning to it. When things happen at night, in John, they're evil. They're either evil, untruth, or ignorance. That's what darkness means in John, in the Gospel of John. Okay? So it's not just the fact that it's night. So when Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, this high ruling um, leader of Israel, essentially what's going on there is he's, he's hiding his actions from everybody else. Because he doesn't want everybody else to know that he has this deep intrigue for, for who Jesus is. And this is early on in Jesus' ministry, the Gospel of John chapter 3. Jesus has done very few things, but those things have already begun to grow momentum and attention. And, and so Nicodemus is, is intrigued by it, and he wants to come, and he, he wants to meet Jesus face-to-face, -face, and he wants to have a conversation with him. All totally normal things that, that men of faith would have done with each other, but doing it at night is, is completely different. So essentially what he's saying is, I want to know enough, but I don't want to have what I'm doing be known by others, if that makes sense. Okay? So that's where, where Nicodemus is at in this process. Another example, Judas left uh, the Passover meal at night to betray Jesus. So the writers are trying to tell you that what he's doing is not right, okay? Because it's done in the darkness. Nicodemus acknowledges that Jesus is a rabbi and a teacher sent from God. Because of the signs, another def way to translate that would be miracles that Jesus is doing. And he recognizes the things that Jesus is doing are amazing and beautiful and good things, and those are things of God. Those aren't things of, of evil. 
And so Nicodemus sees that. But conversations in John are intentional. And they're invitations for the listener to examine themselves and to reevaluate their own lives in light of the truth that they are hearing. So in this, in this story, that's what's happening. A conversation is taking place between Jesus and Nicodemus, but John wants us to understand that conversations have a purpose and a meaning behind it. And the question becomes, will Nicodemus receive the truth that he's been given, and will he do something about it? But also for John, he's saying, will anyone who reads this conversation at any time at all hear the truth and do something about it. So that's us, okay? So do you see the, so we have the historical experience that takes place, but we also, for John, it was, it was much bigger than just that writing. He knew it would, somehow he had this understanding that it would be much greater. So Jesus says, verse three, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus never asked a question. But Jesus gives him an answer. Fascinating. Is he operating in, a, in, in the gift of a word of knowledge here? You see other conversations that Jesus has with religious leaders, and oftentimes their question is something about the kingdom of God. So it's not a surprise that this is what they enter, or this is what Jesus enters into, but that's what he says. He says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So Jesus talks about being able to see the kingdom. Then he says something about being born again. There's a Greek word, anathon, is where this comes from. And it means, uh, again, it means from a higher place, it means from above, it means that which comes from heaven. We have some other examples, I'll show you a couple of them. First Peter 1.23 says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And 1 John, the same author, brings this idea up again in, in 3, 9. No one is, who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. So that concept we see again in the scriptures, which is fascinating. And many people think that Jesus coined this phrase, anathon, but it actually existed before Jesus. Okay? And this is where it gets fascinating. Anathon was a, a, a Jewish custom, and this is what it meant. It was a culture for when Gentiles who had converted to Judaism under rabbinic ritual, okay, this ritual included a full body immersion into what they called mikvah, or the baptismal waters. So what, what was anathon in the Jewish culture, of which it would have been understood, Anathon was a Gentile who came to this idea of conversion or understanding that the Jewish way was the right way and the Jewish God was the one true God. And so they wanted to make a change from being a Gentile into becoming and accepting the Jewish faith. By doing that, they entered into a process called mikvah, which included baptismal waters, to cleanse themselves and to become devoted to that God, Yahweh. That was the understanding of the culture at the time while Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus. It's important that we get this, otherwise the rest of it won't make as much sense. Okay? So rabbis believed that this was the case. And they, they saw this immersion with the Gentiles and they regard, regarded it as being recreated into an Israelite. Rabbi Yosef says this, One who has become a proselyte or a convert is like a child newly born. Emerging from mikvah, or these waters, is very much like a process of rebirth. When an individual enters mikvah, he is re-entering into the womb. And when he emerges, he is as if born anew or born again. So this is language that the rabbis would have used with one another. And as, as, as Nicodemus is sitting there, he's very aware of this concept in their, within their culture. So born again, or being born from above, to this, is not actually an automatic thing. And this is where we need to, to pay attention. There's certain things I want us to hear this morning. This is one of them. Okay? It does not happen. Being born again does not happen when one shows up in church. It does not happen because your parents are believers that you are born again. It happens only and exclusively through faith in Jesus. 
So Nicodemus responds. He says this in verse 4. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asks, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. So again, Nicodemus is, this is not lost on Nicodemus. He understands this concept that Jesus is trying to teach him. But he's confused as to why Jesus' answer to him would be this. Because he, he knows what mikvah is. What he does not understand is why Jesus is inferring that Nicodemus needs to be born again as if he was a Gentile and not a Jew. Jesus, are you inferring that I should re-enter my mother's womb and come out a Gentile so that I can go through the process to become what I already am and convert to Judaism? And this is a valid question for Nicodemus to ask. He's not asking just about being rebirth. It's not, oftentimes we read this and we think, well, Jesus is talking about um, a physical birth and a spiritual birth. Yes, in a way, but it's deeper than that. And unless we understand the custom of the time and the culture we're working with, we won't get this. <clears throat> Jesus says this in verse 5, very truly I tell you, and where, whenever this is said in the scriptures, we have to pay attention to this, because essentially this is what Jesus is saying. Pay attention. No, no, no. Really pay attention to what I'm about to say, is what very truly means. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. So we go from seeing the kingdom to entering into the kingdom. Do you see the difference between the two? So Jesus started with, nobody can see the kingdom unless it, this happens. And he talks about this born again or this mikvah. But nobody can enter the kingdom Unless they are born of water and spirit. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, it's not enough to be Jewish to get into the kingdom of God. Which would have blown his mind. Because for how many years had he seen himself as the chosen of Israel? The chosen of God. And not just the chosen of God, but a high elitist person within that group. How much more higher do I need to go in order to enter into this kingdom that you're talking about, in order to experience what you're experiencing, to be like you? See, water is a symbol of physical birth in our culture. A woman's water breaks, the baby comes. At least that's what we call it. And so there's that symbolism that's there, and, and oftentimes we've tied that together, and especially what Western culture and Western commentaries and scholars have just taken that stance where Jesus is talking about a physical birth, and he's talking about a spiritual birth. But I would say this, I don't think Jesus is saying in order to enter the kingdom of God, you have to have a physical birth. Because there's plenty of people in the kingdom who haven't been born into this world. Are you, are you tracking with me? <laughs> You're awfully quiet. It's a lot to take in. But I don't think, that just seems trivial to me. And I think Jesus is, he wants more, and he's trying to communicate more. This is why this passage is so challenging. But water is also a symbol of purification all throughout the text. Ezekiel 36 tells us this. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. And he goes on to talk about a new heart, putting a, a spirit within you. Titus 3, 4, and 5, probably one of the best verses to understanding what what Jesus is saying in John 3. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Right there, we get both those concepts that Jesus is talking about with Nicodemus. So both water and spirit are two images for spiritual rebirth. Water cleanses and God places his spirit within us. To be born again is to, to leave sin and impurity, cleansed from your heart, and to receive a new spiritual life through a relationship with Jesus. Washing of rebirth. So water is the source of this washing. But it's, it's about sin and repentance. And Paul picks up on this as well. Okay? Jesus is not the only one who uses this language and talks about this. In 1 Corinthians 6.11, Paul says this, to the church in Corinth. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 
The Spirit of God washes us and renews us. Literally a rebirthing process, just like mikvah. You start to see the dots being connected here. The images and scriptures of the work of the Spirit are new birth, renewal, regeneration, and transformation. All those things are taking place within those who've given their life to Christ through the Holy Spirit. It's working on us continually. For Paul, the washing is that of the Spirit, which includes a rebirth and a renewal. The Spirit of God not only cleanses people from past sins, but also transforms them into the likeness of Christ. A rebirth or a renewal is taking place. And Paul understood this, that a radical change is to take place at conversion. He said, radical transformation, going from who you were to who you are in Christ. Literally, he says, it's a new creation, like nothing that's ever existed. We are to be transformed in that way, a reorientation into new life. But this work is tied to the Spirit of God. But for Paul, the primary focus is always on the work of Christ. Always. And what happens to them, to the believers, is literal, a literal death and resurrection happens when we give our life. Our old self dies and a new self is reborn and renewed. This is what Jesus is talking about. He goes on to say in verse 6, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, flesh begets flesh, but spirit births spirit. And this is important for us to grab onto because we're very much a people in a culture that is very connected with with the flesh, things of the flesh. That's what's around us. That's what's in front of us. That's what we most easily identify with. But what Jesus is saying is if you want to see or enter the kingdom, you have to begin to develop an understanding of the spirit and the movement of the spirit that happens within you. It is the only way. How those who are born of the spirit function and live, what does that look like? Jesus shifts gears from two births to a singular focus, and from the rest of the time, he will maintain that focus on the Spirit of God with his conversation. He uses the word born again as well, but like we talked about, it's connected to resurrection, also meaning born from above. But a spiritual rebirth must take place in us if we want to not only see, but enter the kingdom of God. Has to happen. And then he goes on to say, the wind blows where it pleases. So he goes from from these two birth motifs into focusing on the Spirit, saying the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And then he goes on to define what the Spirit looks like and how it begins to move in our lives. We need to pay close attention to this. He said, the wind blows where it pleases. Well, for John, the word wind has a double meaning. Because wind means spirit. Pneuma in Greek, ruha in Hebrew, translated as spirit. The Spirit blows or moves as it pleases, essentially, is what he's saying. It's a clever play on words and a double meaning that's intentionally there. And then he talks about sound in that verse. He says, you hear its sound. Again, here's one of these double meanings in in John, because here's what's fascinating. The word sound literally translates as voice. So what Jesus is saying is the Spirit of God moves as it wills, and you can hear its voice. That's the invitation for us as followers of Jesus. When we give our lives to Christ, we are to begin, we should be the best listeners on earth. Because the Holy Spirit wants to guide us and lead us and take us into the kingdom of God and show us what it looks like so we can begin to operate and function in that place. In order to do that, we need to open our ears and be able to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us. The necessity of us as followers of Jesus to be led by the Spirit is absolutely essential. It's the direct sign of our being born from above, or our capacity to be led by the Holy Spirit and do what the Spirit tells us. Paul says this very thing in Romans 8, 14, where he says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. That's the sign that we're children of God, is that we're led by the Spirit. How are we led by the Spirit? We hear the voice of the Spirit. It prompts us and guides us and leads us. 
And then we begin to manifest things in our lives. And Jesus talks about these things at the end of Mark. And Paul talks about these things as well. And we spent much time as a, as a church body talking about these characteristics that should follow a believer. Like love and compassion and mercy, the fruits of the Spirit. But also tangible actions like healing that's taking place. Like sight being given to the blind. Like setting people free from demonic oppression. Leading people into the relationship with Jesus. Speaking life into the people that we're around. These are all things that should be happening in and through us as followers of Jesus. And those things happen only because we submit ourselves to the movement of God. Through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And Nicodemus naturally says in verse 9, how in the world can this be? It's a valid question. And Jesus says this, you are Israel's teacher, and you do not not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Nicodemus is stuck with what he's just heard. He doesn't know what to do with it. He's baffled by what Jesus is trying to teach him. He's in his mind, again, at the top of his game, and yet he's being told he doesn't get it, nor is he, is he truly in, in the way he wants to be in. And understand, he has not entered the kingdom of God. He's not been able to do that yet. And Jesus is saying that it is not good enough, Nicodemus, where you are. You won't even be able to see the kingdom of God, let let alone enter into it. And then he says this, which probably cut Nicodemus to the heart. He says, you're Israel's teacher. And I think in this statement, I read this in one of the commentaries and it absolutely floored me. Literally, I think what Jesus means here is he's implying that Nicodemus, you were supposed to get this. You were the chosen people. You are the people that God set apart. You are supposed to be a kingdom of priests in this world. You are supposed to be going around and explaining this to to the people. Not only God's people, but the rest of this world. And because you guys didn't get it, I'm here to clarify this for you and to help you understand it. See, if not one is not willing to accept the teachings of Jesus, we spend our time questioning or justifying these teachings. Rather than obeying them, how will we ever receive heavenly things? Very truly, I tell you, again, he has that emphatic thing that he says in verse 11. We speak of what we know. This is the first time that Jesus, that, that John uses this word, lelin. Okay? There's many words in Greek to speak, but this one word, lelin, has, is packed with meaning. In the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, when Lelin is used, it's used when, when the prophets reveal God's word to people. In the book of Acts, it's frequently used to describe the transmission of the gospel message. But for John, in the book of John, when Lelin is used, it is exclusively for Jesus' revelation of the truth of God. Verse 13, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who comes from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus shifts from how do we, is born of the Spirit and what that looks like, into the practical sense of how this is going to play out and what this is going to look like, and what has to happen in order for this to take place. Does that make sense? Jesus reveals to Nicodemus that he is the Son of Man in this moment. And John is not bashful or shy about pulling the curtain away and and revealing Jesus for who he is as Messiah. The other Gospels do it almost in cultural cloak and dagger ways that we miss as Westerners. But John's like, here he is, here he is, here he is. And so for John in chapter 3 to to make this revelation, for Jesus to to out himself in a way to Nicodemus, he must have felt comfortable enough to share this with Nicodemus and entrusted Nicodemus with this deep truth. But he is saying, I'm the one. 
I'm the one you've been waiting for. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Christ. There's a whole other thing we could talk about here of son of man. That's a term that books have been written about. And he says, the one who comes from heaven and has gone to heaven in some mysterious way, this I do not understand. Essentially what Jesus is saying is, is that while on earth he's, he's able to ascend and descend while still being human in human form. When you figure that one out, you let me know what the heck that means. And then he goes on to tell a story that happened in, in the book of Numbers, and I would encourage you to read it some other time. I'm not going to go into it. But Moses, essentially, what's taking place in Numbers 21 is that, the, that the, God has led people out of Egypt, his people, and once again they defy him. And once again they sin, and there's consequences to that sin. And so they're experiencing, they're, some of them are dying, some of them are in pain, and Moses cries out to God and says, what can I do to save these people? And, and he gives Moses instructions. He tells them to fashion this, this serpent and then to hold it up so all of Israel can see it. And when, the, and when the Hebrew people see it, they experience healing. When they look, they turn and look away from their pain, away from their current situation, and they see what's going on, that instantly God heals them. It's not the serpent that heals them. It's not what Moses does that heals them. It's an act of faith. And God heals them through this. But here's what's fascinating, that the, the Hebrews write, or not the Hebrews, but the rabbis write about this. And the word translated pull in Hebrew can also be translated miracle. It's the Hebrew word ness. And the rabbis actually believed, and this is, this is a crazy story, but bear with me here. They believed that Moses threw the snake into the air and it remained there, laying upon a miracle. And that those who looked at the miracle experience the healing of God. And Jesus is saying in the same way that the people were saved or healed in the story in Numbers 21, so it shall be for those who turn to God and believe in Jesus when the Son of Man, when Jesus is lifted up on the cross. Same story happens again, but this time it's for humanity and not just the people of Israel. When Jesus ascends to the pole and is lifted up, it will, in a miraculous way, cause salvation, or in Greek, sozo, healing, transformation, that will take place for those who turn their eyes to Jesus. This further defines for Nicodemus, the one and only way one can enter the kingdom of God is through faith in the Son of Man being lifted up, who is Jesus Christ, forever and ever. I think that's deserving of an amen. Yeah, anybody? Should be at least, if we're in the right place. And then, and then Jesus goes on to say this, and this is, we've heard this, and probably many of us have memorized this. It says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Literally, see how much God loves the world, that he would send his Son, Jesus, not only to die on the cross, but to become human on our behalf, to die for us for the forgiveness of sins, so that those who believed and are born again or born from above will not die, but will experience everlasting life with God. See, Jesus did not come to condemn at that time the world, but to save it. And whoever believes or is awakened to this truth will not be condemned at the end of the age. But those who do not believe or enter the kingdom of God already stand condemned, Jesus is saying. Because they did not believe in God's Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so the answer to the question, who enters the kingdom of God? And if you get nothing else out of this morning, hear these words. First, it is not through ethnicity. It's not from your parents' faith. No one can enter the kingdom of God from your family line. It's not possible. Second, 
It's not through religious beliefs. Religious ceremonies, going to church is not enough to enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't work that way. And finally, it is not through moral acts. You can be a really great person, but it will not get you into the kingdom of God. It doesn't work that way. It is a total spiritual rebirth, a transformation by the Spirit of God. Through faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is the only way one can see and enter the kingdom of God, and everyone is inviting to join in. But it is, and always will be, the only way. So if we want to enter the kingdom of God, this is the path forward has to include a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Our eyes have to turn to the crucified and resurrected Christ, or there's no other way in. No matter what anyone else says, or what any other faith or religion says, or you we see, it is the only way, bar none, period. Only through Christ are we saved. I want to invite you to do this this morning. I want to invite you to stand with me as we pray and as we sing one last song. And I want to invite, I want to ask uh, the prayer team if you would be willing to get up and stand where you were before. And I just want to extend an invitation here for anyone this morning who has not said yes to Jesus. Or you're sitting there and you're thinking, I'm not quite sure. I don't know. Or I've never taken that act of faith or taken that step of faith and said, I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. I want to give you that opportunity this morning. I want to invite you to go to one of the people in the prayer team who's standing on the outside. And I want you to just come before them and say, would you help me? Walk me through this. And they will gladly do that. But I also want to extend the invitation to those of us who feel like we need to maybe renew this faith. Renew this relationship. Maybe we feel like we've strayed off the path. Maybe we've been enticed by things of the world. Whatever it is, if you feel like, I want to get back to that place where I am right with the Lord, as I want to see, and not only see, but I want to enter the kingdom of God, I want to invite you to step out of your seats as well and go for prayer. And just ask the person in the prayer team to lay hands on you and pray for you. And they might lead you through a prayer, a prayer of repentance prayer of reconciliation, a prayer of renewal. So I'm going to pray, and then if, if the Lord is stirring in your heart this morning, listen to that. If the wind is blowing, listen to the voice of God that is speaking to you, that is calling to you. There's no shame here. Only invitation, only love, only renewal, because we want to step into that newness of life that God has for us. And we want to let anything that is in the way, we want to leave it behind. Father, I thank you for how much you love us. I thank you for your presence that is here right now with us. I thank you for your written word, the stories that it, it holds, the power that's there, the depth. It's a beautiful thing. Father, those words don't mean anything if we don't take them into our being. If we don't grab hold of the truth that's before us and almost ingest it into our bodies. I ask that you would help us do that this morning. Father, I thank you for Jesus, for your son that you sent for us so that we may have life. Holy Spirit, stir in this room right now. Stir in the hearts of those that need to get right with you. Get right with the Lord. Convict us. Don't leave us alone. I pray for courage for those who step out in faith for the first time. May you meet them where they are. And draw them to yourself. I ask as a community of faith that you continue to take us deeper into what you have for us. Take us deeper into this kingdom 
that is here with us right now, that is right before us. And may our eyes look to Jesus for everything we need. We ask this in the name of the resurrected Christ, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's sing together. I want to encourage you to take advantage of being prayed for.
according to John, <clears throat> you are now all accountable for this story because you've heard it. You've been invited into the conversation. So continue to wrestle with it. Carry it with you. The truth of who Jesus is, what he was trying to share with Nicodemus. It's the message we are to take into the world and share with the people around us because we're accountable to that as well. Would you join me in, in sharing in the benediction and say it together as we wrap up. We are a community of disciples of Jesus Christ embodying the power and the giftings of the Holy Spirit, cultivating space for healing, living in and expanding God's kingdom on earth. Go in peace. Amen.